Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanakoto Katoa. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Michael, for your welcome and for your introduction. Uh, and can I begin by just congratulating Michael and Tina and the team that have helped organise this event? I organise quite a few conferences in my time. I know the amount of work that goes into this. Uh, so well done. This is an incredibly important topic. So, so thank you. Um, I'd also like to pay tribute uh, in my introduction to the work of the Children's Commission and particularly the current Children's Commissioner, uh, Dr. Russell Wills, who established uh, early last year the Expert Advisory Group on Solutions to Child Poverty, a group of 13 people, of whom I was co-chair with Dr. Tracy McIntosh of Auckland University. It included everyone uh, from the Chief Executive of Business New Zealand, Phil O'Reilly, through to members of various community organisations, a range of academics, and we worked very hard last year uh, and produced a whole series of working papers, one of which um, Jacinda Ardern mentioned earlier today on uh, the idea of a Child Poverty Act uh, and several reports. And I'd like to thank those of you in the audience who uh, contributed to the work of that advisory group. I'm sure there are people here who helped contribute to submissions. We had hundreds and hundreds of submissions over the course of last year. Uh, and many people came to public meetings. We had public meetings all around the country. So for those of you here who contributed that work, um, a great many thanks. And obviously, uh, I'm greatly indebted too to the enormous work that many of you are doing at the coalface of uh, meeting the needs of children up and down the country, uh, whether it's with very disadvantaged children, <coughs> disabled children, or, or children who are called vulnerable or at risk, um, I think we all you know, realise this is tremendously important work and, and i just like to say as an academic who's not doing that kind of work directly, uh, thank you to all of, all of you who are, who are at the coalface. Um, this event already today has kind of triggered many, many different emotions within me. I felt real sadness and shame and really you know, deep concern when I've heard some of the statistics that various speakers have brought to our attention. I have felt sort of admiration at the good work that many people are doing. I have felt inspired um, by some of the examples of things that are, are, are working and uh, the efforts that people are making. Um, I feel daunted by the scope and scale of the challenges we face on multiple fronts in relation to disadvantaged and vulnerable children. And um, I also feel deeply frustrated and slightly embarrassed uh, at the fact that there are so few men in the audience. Uh, in the work that I did last year for the Children's Commissioner, uh, one of the things that struck me again and again and again was the fact that every group of people I went to meet or speak with, uh, there were very few men, or at least a disproportionate number of women. There were some occasions when there were only women, I was the only man, <laughs> uh, present. And that suggested to me that part of the challenge we had is actually about our men. How do we get men interested in and concerned about the issues we've been talking about? Because if we can't, then there's a very substantial part of the electorate that's not going to vote for children's concerns and is not going to voice on behalf of children. And I, I just think, you know, you look around the room today and I suspect it's, you know, 90 and I pay tribute to all the wonderful women here, but you know, there's no reason why there shouldn't be more men. So uh, forgive me if I've trodden on any cut toes in saying that, but um, uh, it's just been so absolutely striking for me as a male over the last 18 months. Um, now, much of what I plan to say in the next half an hour or so uh, has very kindly been said and very eloquently by people like Justine and Jacinda and Judith and Nicola and Deborah and many others. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll try and travel very quickly through some of the territory that's already been covered and dwell more uh, in, in greater detail on issues that haven't been covered so fully and that is particularly the policy realm. I have prepared a fairly full paper for the conference, there are copies available and there's also some um, uh, tables that we'll be looking at uh, shortly. A number of people here began with their personal story and I thought I should just mention briefly uh, one or two aspects of, of, of my life. Um, 
understandably and accurately, many of you will see me as someone who's very privileged. I'm a professor in university, and I've had a very um, fortunate life in many, many respects. Some of you probably don't know, however, and this is one of the reasons that I found working on child poverty quite, um, quite positive in a whole variety of ways. Uh, when I was nine, my parents lost everything. Their business, father's business failed. And uh, we no longer had a house. We had very little furniture. We had deck chairs for our lounge furniture. I remember that very vid vividly for many years. And that had a really quite significant impact on me as a young person. Two things in particular I remember very vividly from that time. Insecurity and shame. Insecurity and shame. The shame of having kids of my own age and stage coming into the home and we had no curtains, we had deck chairs for our home furniture, we had hard wooden seats for our you know, very, very basic table in our dining room. Um, we had very little. And I can remember feeling the insecurity and shame. Now, I need to, I need to uh, temper that by saying we were also incredibly fortunate. My dad was a medic, he was a doctor, and although he'd lost everything, he was in a position to earn a substantial income. My mother was in a position to go out to, go out to work, which she did. Uh, and so after a relatively few years, we were able to buy a house again. <coughs> Most poor families in New Zealand are not in those circumstances. They're not able to go out and earn a large salary. They're not able to go and buy a house again. And not least because houses today are so much more expensive in relative terms than they were 40 or 50 years ago. But my own experience of loss for the family, financial loss, and the insecurity that that generated, and the sense of shame has, has never left me. And, and it's been striking for me that when my kids have had friends who are poor, uh, they have witnessed through their friends the same sort of experiences of going to their friends' homes and their friends feeling a sense of shame that by comparison with my kids and the kind of home they live in, their friends felt uh, shame about their circumstances. <coughs> so th these issues are really quite close to the bone for me in many, many ways. So what I want to do is to uh, focus, <coughs> better use the right governs here, um, start with Nelson Mandela, who amazingly is still alive. <laughs> Uh, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats its children. And I think that's a very pertinent and relevant statement for a conference like this. Um, so in terms of, if I can get this to work, what I wanted to do was just say a little bit about uh, the nature and measurement of poverty, very briefly. Something about the overall sort of shape in dimensions of poverty in New Zealand, and because that's already been mentioned quite a bit today, I'll be quite brief about that, but I do want to highlight some of the really critical features of the landscape of poverty in New Zealand. I want to say a little bit about, whoops, went too fast. I want to say a little bit about um, the reasons why the society has tolerated relatively high rates of child poverty now for more than two decades, uh, and then want to focus on what we might do about it. What's, what sort of strategy might we have for trying to address child poverty over the coming years and talk a little bit about the prospects uh, for success. And just by way of sort of highlighting the, the scope and scale of the situation, in the very short space of time from 1986 to 1994, the rate of child poverty rose threefold in this country, from around 11% to over 30% on one measure and from around 7% on another measure to over 20% uh, on that same measure. Uh, so we witnessed uh, a really extraordinary set of circumstances during that short period. In addition, the children in households regarded as workless, in other words, where the parents were on the benefit, one or other, the unemployment benefit, the domestic, <coughs> domestic purposes benefit, sickness benefit, and so on, the proportion of children in those households who were deemed to be poor on one particular measure went from 20% to 80% in the space of a few years. 
and we really haven't addressed that problem in the last 20 years. We've heard today that poverty has many significant negative impacts on children and on the wider society. I'm not going to dwell at length on that because we've already heard uh, a good deal about that. But it's something we need to be constantly mindful of. So, um, when you think of poverty, uh, we often think uh, of malnutrition, homelessness. Uh, uh, we think of perhaps really abject poverty, if you like, where people don't have enough of, of all the sort of basic things uh, for, for life. Um, and these are sort of the grim pictures we think of. Um, and which probably most of us, if I can move this on, <laughs> um, uh, don't, don't see very often except uh, in tragic cases in Africa or whatever on, on uh, television screens. But it's important to bear in mind, gosh, I wish this thing would work better, <laughs> um, that there are different sort of degrees and levels of poverty, but fundamentally poverty is about not having enough of those things which most people regard as essential. And what people regard as essential is something that is evolving over time. Uh, there are, of course, the very basic essentials for biological existence, for food and water, uh, but there's also shelter and clothing and health care and education. And then, as people have been talking today, the opportunity to participate and belong to society, to be able to be uh, accepted as a full uh, member, uh, as a full citizen of a society, and be able to participate in the institutions of that society. Um, so, I don't know why this, there we go. Okay, so one of the first things just to recognize is that Poverty is multifaceted. It's essentially about not having enough of those things which most people regard as essential. And in that context, it differs from inequality, which is about having more or less uh, of something than someone else. So we do need to distinguish between poverty and inequality. Uh, they are different concepts. They are measured in different ways. Uh, they tend to overlap. Where you have a lot of inequality, you tend to have more poverty. Um, but you can have a situation in which uh, inequality is increasing and poverty is not uh, because of the particular ways in which we measure poverty. Um, essentially, there are two ways, as Justine mentioned this morning, in which we me measure poverty in, in developed countries like New Zealand. Uh, one is through uh, uh, an income-based measure where we set a particular threshold and we do that based on the median household income, so we look at household incomes and we, we find the median point and then we set a threshold related to that median and internationally there are two uh, usual uh, thresholds, either 60% of the median or 50% of the median. Why are they chosen? Well, largely because at around about 50 to 60% of the median it's at the point at which people stop being able to afford those things which most people regard as essential. So somewhere between 50 and 60% of the median is the kind of range uh, where most developed countries have set their kind of income poverty threshold to the extent that there is uh, an official measure. But there's also measures of material deprivation, and I'll say more about those uh, shortly. But we should recognise that in setting poverty benchmarks, uh, this is quite a complicated area. Uh, there are many technical issues. There is no one right measure of poverty. Uh, uh, it, and it's helpful, in fact, to have a range of measures because different measures pick up different aspects of this really quite complex, multifaceted um, uh, thing that we call poverty. You'll be aware that New Zealand doesn't have official poverty measures. I think we should, uh, though relatively few countries do. The United States does, the United Kingdom does, but not very many other countries uh, in the developed world. But there's a very good case for having them. In terms of just some very, very brief comments about poverty in New Zealand, uh, in broad terms, uh, poverty rates is measured by, uh, on an income basis, uh, uh, around the OECD average, or a little bit worse than the OECD average on most of the relevant income-based measures. But for material deprivation, we are uh, certainly worse than most Western European countries, but better than most Eastern European countries. 
and I'll come back to that uh, shortly. So um, in, in broad terms, we're either sort of at around the OECD average or worse for child uh, poverty compared with other jurisdictions. But what is very striking about New Zealand is that our child poverty rates are markedly higher than the rates for uh, older people, those 65 and older, and indeed for the last 30 years or so have been higher than uh, the rates for all other age groups with the exception occasionally of being the same as the rates for, for 18 to 24 year olds. So let's just quickly look at a few tables and figures. Uh, this shows uh, three different measures of poverty based on the work that, that Brian Perry has done for the Ministry of Social Development and Brian has done some fabulous work uh, looking at trends in household incomes over the last 30 years or so. And so most of the data I'm presenting is based on Brian's work uh, drawing on the household uh, economic survey and, and other surveys that have been done uh, of New Zealand households. So three different measures here. One is the, uh, is you, they're all income-based measures. One is using 60% uh, of the median household disposable income which is the green dotted line here. The other, the red line is the 50% of median household incomes and the blue line uh, is uh, the, uh, a measure of poverty in constant value terms where you take a particular reference year and there are two reference years on this figure, 1998, and then it's been recalibrated um, for 2007, so that's why the the, the blue line has a, uh, a gap. Uh, it's been recalibrated to 2007 values. So where you're taking, where you're looking at uh, poverty in, in constant value terms or uh, a sort of a fixed rate terms, you're taking a particular reference year and then you're looking backwards and forwards and you're saying, okay, using that benchmark in real terms, how many children were poor on that same benchmark, say 10 years earlier, or 10 years later. So what this data tells us very starkly is, first of all, if you went back to the early to mid-1980s, we had relatively low child poverty rates on all those measures. Uh, around 11 to 15% for the 60%, around 7%, 8% for the 50% uh, um, of median incomes, and, uh, and uh, in constant value terms based on 1998, uh, benchmark year uh, poverty rates around 12-15% <clears throat> and then you see this dramatic change that occurred in the early 1990s and that was the product essentially of two things uh, a significant rise in the number of people on benefits and a dramatic fall in the real value of benefits of between 10 and 30% and those very sharp reductions in benefit rates in real terms have not been adjusted since which is why um, poverty rates have remained uh, pretty, pretty high in New Zealand for a long period of time. What this data tells you, amongst other things, is that on the 1998 benchmark, in 2007, and I'm sorry if you can see it over here, in 2007, there were more children under that 60% constant value uh, level of, of poverty measure than there were in the 1980s. In other words, there were Children, in, there were more children poorer in 2007 than 20, 25 years earlier. Is that more kids were worse off in real terms, in, in constant value terms, than 20, 25 years earlier. So that's extraordinary because during that period of time, real wages went up uh, 20 or 30 percent. Um, uh, but many of the kids at the bottom were actually worse off. Okay, so getting the right governs here. Now this just shows you the differences in poverty rates across different age groups. The top line is children, the bottom line is older people, uh, 65 plus, and then you've got uh, <coughs> red line is 18 to 24 year olds, uh, the next one is uh, 25 to 44 year olds, and the next one is 45 to, uh, to 64 year olds. And you can, you can see that right through this whole 30 year period from 1982 um, onwards, the child poverty rate has been above the rate of, of poverty for other groups. 
with the exception uh, here of uh, 18 to 24 year olds on a couple of occasions. And you can see that by comparison with older people, child poverty uh, rates have been vastly higher for most of that, most of that period. Uh, that tells you, amongst other things, that we have made a choice as a society to ensure that our older people don't live in poverty, but we've made a choice that a significant number of our children will live in poverty. These are policy choices uh, that are amenable to policy change. Not, not simple necessarily and not necessarily cheap, but amenable to change. Um, in terms of absolute numbers, the numbers of children in poverty depends on the measure you use. Uh, so depending on the measure, anywhere between something like 170,000 and 265,000 uh, would be, would be a, a sort of a valid measure. But uh, as I said before right at the beginning, there's no one, one um, right measure of poverty. Each measure has its own uh, integrity. And we need, I think, to, to be inclusive here and recognize that different measures show different things. Now, just to show you Australia as a counterpoint to the New Zealand situation. If you remember in New Zealand, our poverty rates were quite low and then went up very, very steeply and then have slowly come down a little bit. Well, in Australia, they started off worse than us 30 years ago and they basically tracked down or around the same. A very, very different pattern uh, using the same sort of benchmarks. So, just to show you, you know, across the Tasman, not far away, uh, policymakers have adopted a very different a, a approach to uh, family support and, and addressing child poverty. Um, this is partly because Bob Hawke, uh, back in um, uh, the mid to late 1980s, uh, won an election and said we were going to abolish child poverty. <laughs> he won the election. <laughs> And so they decided they better do something about it. <laughs> um, OK. So very quickly, this will be familiar to you as a result of what people have said earlier today. Uh, if you look at the data, child poverty is particularly concentrated in families with young children and in families with three or more children. So it's particularly a function of families with young children, not surprising, because that's when parents typically uh, can't both be in work, or at least in full-time work. And, and, la and larger families uh, suffer because of the particular way we've designed our family support arrangements, our family tax credit arrangements, which give disproportionate amount of support to uh, smaller families rather than larger families. Uh, as was mentioned, the, ben the beneficiary rate of poverty is much, much higher uh, than non-beneficiaries. But nonetheless, over a third of children are in households where at least one uh, parent is in full-time employment. So it's not just a beneficiary issue. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, the figures with respect to Māori and Pacifica are truly stark. Um, on income-based measures, uh, child poverty uh, in Māori and Pacifica communities are at least double those of Pākehā community. Uh, on a material deprivation basis, hardship basis, probably three times. There's also much greater persistence of poverty and probably more severe poverty. So. Um, Māori and Pacifica particularly, um, children particularly suffering. Um, <clears throat> so some of this will be familiar to you. I do want to just, if you just look at point seven there, uh, the, the, the figures here are really very stark. Uh, around 6% or 50,000 children, that's around 5% of all children, there's a 1 point, well, 1 million and 60,000 children in this country. So 50,000, 6, 5, 6% 6 spend 13 to 14 years in a benefit-supported family uh, by the age of 14. <laughs> uh, and around 21% to 180,000 spend more than half of their first 14 years in a benefit-supported family. So if the benefits are set at a rate that ensures that that family is in poverty, those children are going to be in poverty. <coughs> and that's essentially what we've done. And this shows it very graphically. Uh, this shows what's happened in terms of poverty rates for children in workless homes as opposed to, if you like, working homes. Um, and uh, the huge rise here is essentially the, the benefit cuts and the little decline here is the reintroduction of income-related rents by the former Labor government in the early 2000s uh, and then um, You've also got 
hear the impact of working with the families, which delivered assistance disproportionately to families in the workforce rather than in beneficiary households. So you can see that they benefited in particular as a result of working for families. So those figures really are graphic and extraordinary and I find shameful and sobering. Um, dear me. Okay, so moving then to material deprivation measures. When you're trying to work out uh, material deprivation, you're basically asking a number of questions. First of all, what are the things that people need? What are, what are things that can be regarded as essential? And you can do that by literally asking a group of people like this, 100 people in a room, okay, do you regard X as essential? Do you regard people uh, having, I would say, a raincoat or a pair of sturdy shoes or the capacity to heat their home? Are these essential or non-essential? And if more than 50% of people think they're essential, then they deem to be essential. So that's sort of basically how it's done. So is it essential? Then you ask people in a survey, do you have it? Yes or no? If you don't have it, is it because you can't afford it or because you've chosen not to have it? If it's because you can't afford it, then you're deprived. Okay. So what I've handed out for you to look at, and it's also in the paper, table three gives you a sense of some of the data in New Zealand based on <clears throat> a survey done in 2008 on sort of material deprivation among children uh, in different types of households in New Zealand. So if you can look at table three, this is one of the most stark pieces of sort of social science research I've ever seen in some ways, certainly in relation to um, income data. As you will see, there's different sort of level, uh, living standards levels. There are seven of those. If you look to the second line, you'll see distribution of children across those seven LC, or economic living standards index levels. And you'll see that 10% are in the most significantly deprived, then 10% in the second most significantly deprived, and around 45% of children are in the least deprived uh, three uh, categories, uh, five to seven. And then you look down, first of all, there are 12 child-specific items, uh, and then there's uh, enforced lacks uh, reported by respondents uh, in the children's in the child's family, so that would be one or other of the parents, um, presumably of the, of the child in question or the children in question. And what is absolutely staggering here is, if you look down the right-hand column for the children in the 45 percent, well, 45 percent of children in this country in the top three economic living standards levels, there is hardly any material deprivation, and nor do their parents go lacking in any respects in relation to these particular items that the majority of people regard as essential, or at least highly desirable. And uh, if you look down the first column uh, of the 10% of children who are in the most deprived LC group, you will see really extraordinary levels of lack <laughs> of deprivation. Uh, and when you look at the multiple lacks, halfway down you'll see the multiple lacks of children's items for the children who, who lack at least three or more of the 12 items, 60% of those in that bottom 10% of house, of, of, of by living standards, 60% um, of those children are missing out on at least three of the 12 items. And if you go right down to the bottom, you'll see of the 20 items listed, um, there's a measure for five or more items and a measure for eight or more items. You'll see that for five or more, more items, 80% of uh, those families in that most deprived 10% uh, were missing out on at least five or 20 items. Whereas none were in the top 45% of households. And I think this, amongst other things, just gives you a very, very graphic picture of two New Zealands. The children at the bottom and at least 50% or more who frankly miss out on very, very little. And it may also help explain why the people in the top sort of 50% have very little understanding of what's going on at the bottom. They live in different communities, they don't socialise necessarily, and their experience of life is just radically different. It's just radically different. So uh, 
I better move on. <laughs> okay, so this just gives you an international snapshot. This is using the official material deprivation index of the European Union with a nine item list rather than a 20 item list. This is a nine item list and the cut point here is three or more items. Uh, so if you're missing out on three or more of these nine items, then you're deemed to be deprived. And you'll see that for children, the deprivation rate in New Zealand back in 2007-2008 was around 18%. For those aged 65 plus, it was one-sixth of that, 3%. And then you'll see for the best performing Western European economies like Sweden and the Netherlands, the child deprivation rate was 6-7% adult, sorry, the elderly deprivation rate, the same as New Zealand, 3%. And again, that just highlights Sweden and the and Netherlands have made a decision, conscious decision, to minimize deprivation among the elderly and children. And, and we have made a very, very, I think, appropriate decision to ensure we minimize deprivation, deprivation uh, for our elderly, but we've tolerated very significant deprivation among our children. So, I'm going to be very quick. Uh, there's a heap of literature on the damaging consequences of poverty. Some of it's been mentioned today. I'm not going to go through that again uh, with you now. Um, uh, just to say why are the rates of child poverty in this country as high as they are? Uh, there are multiple reasons, but they include, obviously, uh, a significant number of Households which are dependent on, on, on benefits of one kind or another. The large benefit cuts were obviously incredibly significant because they essentially shifted uh, something like 60% of beneficiary households uh, who were previously above the poverty line to below the poverty line. Um, and because they haven't been adjusted in real terms since, uh, then that's persisted. Then you've got a whole lot of other things. Uh, the core benefit rates, as I said, have been indexed to CPI but not adjusted for increases in, in wages. Wages uh, during the period 1994 to 2011 went up <coughs> something like 24 percent in real terms and household median incomes went up 40 percent in real terms while those at the bottom <coughs> stayed still basically. Um, we've also got the problem that our family assistance programs like Working for Families have been designed primarily to assist working families rather than families who don't have work. Um, uh, Many of those forms of assistance have not been fully indexed to the CPI, so although there's been occasional you know, significant increases in the quantum of money, that's then got eaten away as a result of a failure to index fully. And that's happening right now as we speak. The Working for Families package, the indexation provisions were amended several years ago, so they're no longer fully applying. So over the next few years, uh, those who are dependent on family uh, family tax credit and so on will be, and in work tax credit will be getting less in real terms for their children. Um, we've had issues over the uh, design of our housing assistance programs. The accommodation supplement, for example, has not been adjusted for CPI in, I think, six years, uh, and it's capped at a certain amount. Um, uh, and the way it's designed is such that if you have a household with four people in it, that's the maximum you can get. So if you happen to have six children, there's eight of you, well, you get no more in terms of the accommodation supplement than a household with two kids and two adults. Uh, so the way we've designed our policies has reinforced and intensified poverty, particularly for larger families. And who has larger families? Well, particularly Maori and Pacifica, particularly Pacifica. We've had these huge increases in uh, residential uh, electricity tariffs uh, over the last 20 years, 70% or so, and of course this is a kind of a basic item for most households. Uh, so if the real cost goes up 70% but your real incomes remain constant, well you're going to be relatively worse off. And for those with very little discretionary income, obviously that has profound consequences. It means amongst other things people literally can't afford electricity or they, they, they're constantly running out of money, and which means they're, they're, how, they're, they're, you know, they're having their electricity cut off uh, on a fairly regular basis with very damaging consequences. Um, 
moving right along, how do we explain the fact that as a community, as a society, we've tolerated much more significant levels of child <coughs> poverty and deprivation for more than 20 years? Uh, well, it can't be because of a lack of data, because we've had a, some really good data. It can't be because of, simply because of a lack of advocacy, because we've had some very, very powerful advocates on behalf of children. <coughs> Children's commissioners, the work of the Child Poverty Action Group, uh, numerous clinicians and other medical health-related groups up and down the country, etc., etc. So I, I don't think we can simply explain it on, on, on a lack of advocacy. It seems there's been other factors at play, uh, not least a, a really, I think, quite a fundamental shift in values uh, in this country. And let me just mention in that regard uh, a little bit of the data that we have on what's been going on. Um, it's probably best if I read this, it would be quicker. Support for egalitarian values in New Zealand has been in steady decline over the past three decades on the basis of the social science data we have available to us. As a result, there is now greater acceptance of income inequality and relative poverty and less support for income redistribution. For instance, whereas in 1992, around 70% of those surveyed endorsed a progressive tax system with those on higher incomes paying a greater proportion of their incomes in tax than lower income earners, by 1999, support had fallen to 60%, so down from 70%, and by 2009, just over 50% supported a progressive income tax. So a very substantial reduction over the period of 20 years. Likewise, the proportion of New Zealanders who support government measures to reduce income differences between the rich and the poor fell from 50% in 1992 to 40% in 2009. And there was a similar reduction in the proportion of people who thought that income disparities were too large. Related to this, less than half the population, 43%, agreed in 2009 that the government should provide a decent standard of living for those who are unemployed. In other words, the majority of New Zealanders think that the government should not provide a decent standard of living for those who are unemployed. And, and that, of course, is reflected in what we've done. So uh, one of the fundamental issues we have to face if we're going to address issues of child poverty is how do we shift people's values so that people value children not living in poverty and not experiencing material deprivation. And I think that is a really fundamental kind of sociological and, and, and ethical challenge we face as a, as a community. Now, there's a lot more I could say on that, but I'll move on now to policy because I want some time for questions. So on the policy front, what, what can and should we be doing? Well, the first thing is we should be learning lessons from other jurisdictions. In particular, those countries which have persistently had low levels of child poverty, like the Scandinavian countries, like the Netherlands, like Austria. And we should also be seeking to learn from countries which have made a deliberate matter of public policy to reduce their child poverty rates uh, over extended periods of time. And that includes the United Kingdom uh, from the late 1990s until at least the global financial crisis. Uh, Ireland, roughly the same period, and Australia from the late 80s through, uh, uh, in fact, uh, until quite recently. So um, uh, there is lots that we can learn from those countries. Fundamentally, uh, the countries which have low rates of child poverty and material deprivation uh, are countries which typically have uh, relatively low rates of inequality, income inequality, and or uh, a very effective system of uh, redistribution of income through the tax and welfare system. Uh, so if you take a country like Canada, which is actually quite unequal, like the United States in terms of, in terms of market incomes, Canada has a much, much more effective uh, redistribution system in terms of its tax and welfare system, which means that uh, whereas its child poverty rates uh, before tax and welfare around the same as the US, after tax and welfare policies take effect, its child poverty rate is halved relative to the United States. So you can, even in a context of a country with higher than average uh, levels of income uh, disparity, or income inequality, you can nonetheless uh, have an effective system of re redistribution which will significantly lower your poverty rates. In the countries which have embarked on serious efforts to reduce child poverty, they've typically incorporated a range of measures. There's no one sort of magic bullet. There's a range of measures these countries have used, and they've included 
very explicit targets, like halving child poverty, which was the target of the former British Labor government, um, or you know, very explicit pledges to eliminate child poverty, as in uh, Bob Hawke's pledge in about 1987. You've had uh, the use of uh, significant uh, uh, cash transfers to low-income households through the use of both universal and targeted forms of assistance. So not just targeted assistance, but, 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 but also, in some cases, universal assistance, um, which provided assistance both to working households and non-working households. And you've also had significant investment in, in, in children through early childhood uh, programs of one kind or another, uh, uh, health care, and so on and so forth. <coughs> So if we're going to address child poverty in New Zealand, we need to learn from the lessons of other jurisdictions, but we also need to be mindful of the specific and distinctive features of poverty uh, in this country, which include, as I've mentioned earlier, um, issues around beneficiary households, uh, the high rate of sole parenthood in this country, and, and the, the fact that, in fact, um, uh, by OECD standards, uh, the rate of employment among sole parents is, is relatively low. It's not very low, but it's relatively low by OECD standards. <coughs> and that raises some issues, which we mentioned here, which perhaps we should talk about later. Um, there's the defective arrangements in relation to child support. Uh, we have a system in this country, unlike that of most other countries, where if you're a beneficiary and your non-custodial partner is paying uh, maintenance, uh, all of that, uh, at least, unless they're earning a huge amount, uh, simply goes to the Inland Revenue Department. So the, the, the custodial parent gets nothing. Uh, and not only does that mean that the child doesn't enjoy any benefit, it also means that there's a disincentive for the non-custodial parent to pay, uh, which potentially disrupts relationships uh, between that parent and, the, and, and, and their child or children. I've mentioned the poor design of income support arrangements uh, and electricity prices. The one thing I didn't mention earlier, but it really is absolutely crucial, and that is house prices. One of the reasons why poverty has become more intense over the last 20 years or so is because in relative terms, housing costs have gone up quite significantly. And we need to address that problem if we're going to address child poverty. And that's a very, very significant challenge. And it's not just the price of houses, of course. It's not just the issue of low affordability. It's also uh, the problem of poor quality. We have a very poor housing stock, uh, which has been damaged further by the leaky building problem and, of course, the Canterbury earthquakes. So um, the final thing we need to recognise, and then I'll get to the policy and I'll be as quick as I can, but the other thing we have to recognise is the magnitude of the challenge. If we were to take families who are currently exceeding at around 50% of the median household income to, say, 60% of the household median income, we would need to give those families a minimum of around $100 extra a week. Bear in mind that around 16 to 17% are below the 50% median. So that even if you took those who are currently on the 50% median to the 60% median by giving them at least $100 extra a week, in some cases it would be double that for a big family, um, you would still only get them, <laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd still have you know, 15, 16% below the 60% median, which is significantly more than was the case 30 years ago, when it was as low as 11%. So uh, in giving households an extra $100, let alone $200 a week, is a substantial fiscal cost if it was to be done solely through the tax system or the tax welfare system. Um, we're talking you know, several billion dollars. And that means we have to face the reality if we're going to do that of raising additional tax revenue. And that raises the questions as to how we do that in a fair and reasonable way. But there are ways, in my view, that we could. So um, the expert advisory group on solutions to child poverty wrestled with these issues. Uh, we took the view that we can reduce child poverty, we ought to reduce child poverty, and we ought to reduce it significantly. We suggested, as a minimum, sort of 30 40% reductions over a period of time. Uh, and for severe and persistent poverty, we thought we should we should be seeking to reduce uh, uh, poverty by a much greater amount than that. Um, we put forward a range of proposals. 
covering both in-kind support and in-kind assistance. Uh, and I'm sorry, time is sort of running out on me, so I'll be very brief here. But we basically took the view that we needed to recalibrate the family tax credit system and move all uh, rates up to the top rate, which is currently paid to uh, the families with 16 and 17 year olds who are the first child. Uh, at that rate is something around $103 a week. We, we said we should raise all rates up to that, uh, that we should review all benefit rates with a view to linking benefits uh, again to wages, not just to prices, uh, that we should rethink the in-work tax credit, which has been highly controversial, uh, that we should adjust uh, the accommodation supplement in various ways, particularly to support larger families, um, and that we should um, encourage uh, and support child-appropriate employment, uh, particularly for sole parents. Uh, and that would be through, in particular, support for those parents to work uh, through uh, adequate assistance with, with childcare, uh, early childhood education, uh, transport, and so forth. We also said we should be doing more on the in-kind support front. Uh, we should be extending the current uh, subsidy rates for under six-year-olds for healthcare to all children. Uh, we should be looking to uh, improve the quality of housing, uh, particularly in the private rental area. Uh, we should be developing a strategy for food and schools, which the government, in fact, has taken up to some degree at least, uh, and so on and so forth. So just wrapping up, um, uh, sorry, I should probably go back and say, OK, what are the prospects of success? Well, uh, fundamentally, it seems to me, it's about persuading the New Zealand community that we ought to be addressing the challenge of child poverty. Uh, my feeling at the moment is that we have yet to fully get that message through and secure adequate support. Uh, I think it's happening, but it's, 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 I think we've still got quite a long way to go. And then fundamentally, if we're going to be delivering greater assistance through the tax welfare system to families, and particularly to low-income families, we have to address the challenge fiscally of how we raise the revenue to support that. Uh, there are options available like a capital gains tax, uh, reintroducing inheritance taxes, a somewhat higher uh, top tax rate and top uh, trust tax rate and so on, but of course these are politically sensitive matters and unless you have the groundswell of support uh, for addressing uh, is issues of poverty then obviously politicians are going to be very reluctant to introduce such measures. I've mentioned there Aristotle uh, and his emphasis on logos, ethos and pathos. What's he talking about? Well he's talking about the use of argument and reason uh, the use of ethical arguments, principles of justice, the rights of children, and so on, and of course, pathos, um, emotional appeal, highlighting the shame uh, of having a society like ours, uh, which is providing food to, what is it, 40 million people around the world, uh, but which has many of its own children uh, not adequately nourished, partly, at least in some cases, because their families simply can't afford uh, to feed them well. And finally, just to conclude, oh dear me, there we go, all right. So fundamentally, what I've tried to lay out before you is that child poverty is a serious issue in this country. We have changed dramatically as a country from a situation where we had low poverty rates for children, at least on an income measure, to now quite significant poverty rates for children, rates that are substantially higher than for most other age groups. We have tolerated that for a long period of time. We should not have done so. It is having damaging consequences, both for the children who suffer and for society as a whole. We will all pay in the end uh, through a variety of ways. Uh, we should be addressing this challenge. We can address the challenge. Other countries have done so. We have a lot to learn from them. We have some distinctive issues which we need to address, which I believe we can and should, but it requires public support. Uh, for the, to have this, if you like, the political wind uh, to generate the policy changes required. So I hope I've left you with a, a message that's both sobering but also hopeful. Uh, thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions for a few minutes. I'm sorry to use up too much of my time. <laughs>